working with generation and Clark, Satellite Program Coordinator at the Jefferson. Folks, as we begin today's event, I'd like to remind everyone tuning in that we're, talking, we're taking your questions via the comment section on Facebook. If you have a question, please share. I'd like to thank our speaker, Jacob Marsh, a Ramey, Ramey Fellow graduate and Jefferson Civic Leadership Academy alum for presenting his, re his research findings today. I'd like to also thank Dr. J Dr. Andrew Roth for moderating the conversation with me. Dr. Roth is a Jefferson scholar in residence focusing on leadership, media, and social studies. He designed, built, and facilitates the Remy Fellowship Program, which was launched in 2018. With this, I'd like to hand it over to you, Dr. Roth, to introduce in our speaker and the program. Thank you, Raven. Uh, as Raven said, my name is Andy Roth. I'm a scholar in residence at the Jefferson Educational Society. Uh, in addition to writing the book notes column and giving my own presentations on various topics, uh, one of the things I do is facilitate the Ramey Fellows Program, which is a subset of the Jefferson Civic Leadership Academy. The Jefferson Civic Leadership Academy is a hands-on leadership development program for our up and coming aspiring young professionals in the greater Erie and Erie County area. And the Ramey Fellows, uh, at the request of some alumni of the program several years ago, the Ramey Fellows were uh, founded to do two things. One, to add to the Civic Leadership Academy, which I should point out to people who perhaps don't know this, uh, meets monthly from roughly June till February. Uh, and each month they go and visit uh, government officials, non-NGO, non-government agencies, uh, and other not-for-profit entities and for-profit entities in Erie County, meeting with the principals and learning their leadership challenges. Uh, in addition to that, as I said a minute ago, uh, some alums a couple of years ago asked us for a program that would do two things. One, uh, perhaps uh, expose them to a bit of leadership theory, and two, give them the opportunity, in addition to the overall research project the uh, larger group does, uh, to do an independent research program. And so the, the Ramey Fellows consists of uh, two parts. One, a four or five part, four or five session, mini, and I emphasize mini, mini seminar uh, in leadership theory, uh, really not designed to teach leadership theory so much as to expose the participants to some ideas about leadership about which they can think and, and perhaps on their own pursue further reading or, or further uh, investigation. What brings us to today's program, however, is part two of the Ramey Fellows, which is each of the participants in order to be designated a Ramey Fellow uh, conducts an independent piece of research. Uh, this year's cohort has been extremely productive and we've had three excellent presentations today. Corrine Thomas did one on high-speed rail or the potential for high-speed rail in uh, Northwest Pennsylvania. Sarah Provencio did one on navigating the legal um, current, so I'm not sure it's quite the right word, but navigating the legal process for a person transitioning their gender. It was a very detailed FAQ, if you will, uh, leading them through how you actually go about doing this uh, in, within the constructs of uh, Erie County, Pennsylvania's government structure and the state of Pennsylvania. I think two weeks ago, Susanna Faulkner did an interesting program on insti instituting a minimum basic income in North and Erie County. Uh, her program was poverty is not, poverty is a policy choice. And next week we'll be hearing from Jessica Taylor who will be talking about economic development and the importance of co-working spaces as an economic development tool in greater Erie and Erie County. But more importantly today, we're gonna hear from Jake Marsh on working with Generation Z, which of course is the youngest generation currently entering the workforce. I'm gonna let Jake explain that to you at some length today. Jake's got a very information rich presentation for your benefit. Jake is the industry relations coordinator at Penn State Barron. He's a graduate of Grove City College with a bachelor's degree in biochemistry. He did research in virology research at Penn State Hershey, and he has a master's degree in project management from Penn State's world campus. He was instrumental in founding, and as a matter of fact, currently oversees the innovation commons at Penn State Barron, 
Uh, the Innovation Commons is a product design and rapid prototyping center staffed by undergraduate students. In fact, I believe uh, Jake will be doing his presentation from that exact venue, and some of his students may actually show up, hopefully to give him moral support. In any event, the Innovation Commons is a founding, Jake is a, the Innovation Commons is a founding member of both Penn State's initiative the Invent Penn State Initiative, and the Northwest Pennsylvania Innovation Beehive Network. Uh, throughout its six years of operation, it has served hundreds of entrepreneurs and developed new businesses and patents, creating jobs and providing exceptional experiences for undergraduates. Jake also helps develop, fund, and manage various other programs involving entrepreneurship, economic development, and industrial partnerships with Penn State Erie, the Barron campus. But today, Jack is going to talk about working with Generation Z. Generation Z is entering the workforce. They offer a new set of strengths, weaknesses, preferences, and skills. Leaders and managers must understand what motivates them and learn how best to utilize their unique strengths and remedy their weaknesses. In this presentation, Jake will review the rapidly developing data regarding Gen Z while offering, and this I think for those of you who are in fact managers and work with young people, it concludes by offering some very practical guidance for those who wish to lead, and particularly who wish to lead them well. So with that introduction, I am going to step back and turn the screen over to Jake Marsh. Jake. Uh, thank you both uh, very much for uh, the introduction and for the opportunity to talk about this today. This is a really interesting topic for me, um, mostly because I uh, spend much of my day with students that um, are in this generation or very close to it, right on the edge. Uh, this is a generation that's um, going to become more and more important very quickly, uh, has, is already important, but is becoming very instrumental um, in society. So what triggered my interest in this is, is, is a couple things. Well, first of all, the Generation Z is entering the workforce now. So you, you may, if you're an employer, have some of their uh, cohort in your organization already. Um, but by 2040, it'll be half of all of your workers it will be from this generation or, or a younger generation afterward. Um, so here's another representation of just sort of the direction that we're going here. So it's, it's, not, it's pretty obvious what's happening, right? But you can see the slope of Generation Z coming up and boomers uh, exiting um the the workforce uh so that makes it very important but what but if this is more important to me than those statistics personally and these are the students that work for me a great picture um of them in our laboratory which is where i am right now if you can see me and see what's behind me that machine is right where they are um, but you know over the years of even the past six years of working with students um having students work you know doing this kind of product development uh, prototyping uh, very difficult, clever work. Um, I've noticed that there's been some substantial changes over the years uh, in their preferences, their motivations. Uh, so I wanted to look into that and share some of that. Um, so first of all, what is this sort of science like and what's wrong with it? I'm going to tell you both. Um, so first of all, what defines a generation? Um, it's not so much time that defines them. It is events that occur. So it might, might seem obvious but 9-11 was a huge defining moment for millennials uh, and for Generation X too, um, as, as well. Uh, so catastrophes are a common cause. I, I like to say it's where were you whens. All of the where were you whens um, are important moments uh, for generations that influence the way that they think and, and you know, their sort of motivations. The recessions, abundance periods, those sorts of things as well what the state of technology is like that they're growing up in, very important. And what sort of cultural trends um, are, are going on? What political movements, who, who's, who's the bad guy? I grew up, my young life, I had, there was a bad guy. And uh, occasionally there are, and that influences the way that you see the world and, and interpret things. Um, and their previous generation. I mean, who are their parents? Parents have a huge influence um, and the way that they parent their kids can have a last, lasting effect as a generation. Um, and, and also location is important. I'll mention this more in a moment, but 
not just where you are in the world, but where you are in the country matters when it comes to trying to find that border for what, a, what really generation a person is in. So the bottom line here is that generation science has big error bars. Um, so you need to understand that some of these are generalizations that are not certainly not going to apply to every individual and even don't apply to the whole generation. So think of these more as guideline, useful information, but not definitive information. Don't make a, a judgment about a person based on this. It's, it just influenced your judgment of that person. The last caveat is that um, they're still young. This is still a young generation. And a lot of this research that even the research that I was able to read and that I'm going to be presenting is already a little old. I mean, COVID had a huge effect. This was their, their catastrophe that's going to influence their lives from now on is COVID. So and hopefully nothing worse afterward. Um, so what are the birth ranges? You've seen charts like this before, maybe, or maybe you have some complaints about charts like this. I, I personally do, in fact, but you can look at these previous generations and un understand a little bit about the time period. So these little sort of mild white areas are where there's some overlap in generations forming. So for example, I was born in 1981 but I don't feel like a millennial. I, I certainly relate better to Generation X. And part of the reason for that um, is that I, I grew up in the Erie area, which is sort of an, um, kind of a joke, but it's not really kind of a little behind uh, some uh, other areas of the country. And I have an older brother who's substantially older than me, who I admire. So I followed some of his, in some of his footsteps and some of the things that he liked, I liked. So it, it is important to understand that these borders are pretty fuzzy. So, um, you know, keep that in mind as we move forward. Uh, but, but those young people who are being born today are either Generation Z members or the next generation, Generation Alpha, which they will probably change the name of before long. So here's a quick review about what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this because I'm going to spend way too much time on each. Uh, technological lifestyle, we'll go through communication preferences, talk about their social traits, um, whether they are, whether they have a proficiency for innovation, and then what their workplace looks like. So what their preferences are for work in a general sense. Uh, and then lastly, I'll tell you a little bit about what sort of leader you, you should strive to be with this generation, and then I'll make some recommendations. So first of all, let's start with technology. Um, these young people are embedded in technology more than any other generation in history. Uh, that may seem obvious, but it has a huge effect on their lives. Um, these were the sort that were born with an iPhone in their hand uh, and have have embraced technology to the point where um, it is essential for them, uh, or they sense that it is essential. So I think of this technology as sort of millennial plus. Millennials really dived into technology um, that was produced by the previous generations, but uh, Gen Z is born in it. They live in it every day. In fact, they um, they have what, what is called phone separation anxiety. You may have experienced this yourself. You leave your phone somewhere behind, you drive away and you're, oh crap, I don't have my phone, what do I do? Well, two thirds of Gen Z were, report high stress when they are away from their phone, even for a short time. Um, likewise, almost the same number say they use their phone more than five hours a day and almost a quarter use their phone more than 10 hours a day. So this is sort of their version of television from my generation, which was in front of the tube all day, they're using their phones. They're also very highly involved in social media. It is a part of their identity and their lifestyle. Um, I've shown, I, I've got a couple of their favorite social networks on the screen, Instagram, TikTok, um, YouTube. You'll notice the absence of Facebook. There are a lot of Facebook users in this generation, but it's certainly going away quickly. Um, they make a strong, they have a strong emotional investment in social media. Uh, and they also use it to get their news uh, more than any other source. Uh, they use websites and they use social media to get at least to the news. 
Um, and they, they do recognize that this usage is a significant distraction. Uh, so they acknowledge that there is a challenge to be had to, to be solved here. Um, so they understand there's an issue. So that's good for you if you're an employer um, that you can address that issue. Uh, however, it's important to understand that this is a part of their life. So just banning the use altogether and maybe your organization might not be a great idea. Um, moving, moving on, um, this is sort of technology and sort of more about innovation. But this group uses YouTube and other, other similar services as a strong part of their education. In fact, the, the students that work for me, I encourage them to learn off of YouTube. I encourage them to go out there and find the information that they need, learn it on their own. Uh, I consider that extraordinarily positive. Uh, it, it helps them to advance very quickly um, on their, by their own desire. But what it does do and what, what is, a, is a challenge that we have yet to figure out any solution to is that they don't have terribly good source validation skills. Um, this may have more a lot to do with them simply being young, but young and embedded in a very complex and overwhelming fire hose of information all the time through all of that social media um, and through YouTube, they're not always the best at understanding bad information, separating the bad from the good information. Uh, so that would be a weakness associated with that. The last uh, a bit in technology is I, I call them reluctant multitaskers. These are people who can multitask because they're so accustomed. Um, I'm going to avoid the, the controversialness of the term multitask. Uh, just take it for the colloquial use. Um, they tend to be quite good at it though. They don't like it, but they tend to be quite good at it. Um, so you can, uh, uh, my students particularly, they work on many projects at the same time. Um, but they prefer not to. Uh, so keep that in mind. The next subject I like to talk about is communication. Um, the first piece is that they, they have a self-perception of their communication skills being weak. Um, I think the jury's out on this one still. I, I, I think that they're, they're young and they're learning communication skills. I've seen tremendous growth in several of my own students and workers from their generation um, so I don't know if this is a real problem, but there are other concerns that we have, but they do recognize that they have, they may have an issue. Um, one thing that you might not expect out of this group, however, um, they do prefer personal relationships at work. So I'll be going into a little bit more of this later, but you, they want a relationship with their job, with their boss that goes beyond just the typical, my boss is here to command me and I do what they say. So certainly not the boss worker relationship that um, boomers and Gen X have had in the past. This is a more of a personal relationship and they really wanna get feedback uh, from you in person too. That's, that's something that's valuable to them. They want that personal element. Um, and the feedback that you give uh, should be uh, more than something like this meme is showing, you know, you you want to you want to give some meaningful feedback frequently. Lastly, and something that um, can be annoying for older people is that they expect rapid response to messages, right? So if they communicate to you, um, they would like to see something back right away, or they they will experience some anxiety, or they will misunderstand the reason for the delay. So you could just be working on something else. Um, but they, they really would prefer you to respond quickly to communications. And that is because they're so embedded in this constant flow of communication with each other through social media and through texting each other and through just constant communication um, that a delay is unusual. Uh, so it can cause some, some stress. So keep, keep that in mind. Um, Uh, the, the next one I also associate somewhat with them being young, uh, but they don't immediately grasp what communication to use professionally. So it's good to lay out some, some guidance for this um, and give them a little bit of leeway at the beginning so that they can understand sort of what 
methods they should be using. So here's a long quote. I know you're not supposed to read long quotes on, on presentations, but I'm going to do it anyway because I think it's great. This is by Dr. Stephanie Creary at Wharton School back in 2019. She said, I came from Generation X, which I can relate to. And I think our generation was raised to appreciate the value of a phone conversation or a private meeting, as opposed to someone on an open forum that is easily shared, something on an open forum that is easily shareable. That is a challenge to people now entering the workforce, Generation Z, helping them understand what is the most appropriate form of communication. When you use email, when do you stop by someone's office and schedule a meeting? There are real differences in terms of expectations and you will definitely run into this with this generation. I personally prefer the way they communicate very quickly and very succinctly, um, but you may not, and it may be inappropriate. Um, so, you know, be ready for that and have a, some way to inform them on what the appropriate communication network is. Uh, an advantage, however, of all of this is that they're very at home in programs like Discord and Slack and Teams and collaborative software packages. This is something that they're accustomed to. Um, I use Snapchat with my students to reach them immediately when I need to reach them instantly, and it works great. Uh, lastly, um, TLDR, if you're not familiar, is, is internet short for too long, didn't read. Try not to make everything your communications to, your, to these young people so long. They, they, they won't read it. I mean, that, that's something that even I might not do, but um, keep it pithy, right? Keep the, uh, the main thing, the main thing in communications. The next topic, which is uh, uh, you know, related, is um, what sort of social aspects do we expect from this generation? And um, uh, I've, I've gone and shown you all the bullets. Don't read all the bullets yet. Let me, let me go through them with you. Um, they prefer that human element. So I, I mentioned earlier that they want that, that meeting with you. They want to see you face to face and get feedback face to face. They want those strong relationships. Um, a lot of that comes from their desire for belonging as a part of social media. Um, but they also sort of use this desire for belonging very well in activism. So they are the most connected generation ever, for sure. They have a lot of interaction with each other across the globe. It's easier than ever to organize online and they're experts at this. Uh, they also have this sense that they're the ones that have to save the world, uh, which is good for all of us, right? Um, Millennials shared a, a similar feeling. I think Generation Z's feeling is even stronger. And if I have a guess, I would say that COVID maybe made that desire even stronger if it, um, unless it, you know, uh, increased their cynicism. They are certainly compassionate and thoughtful people. Um, and they do value, uh, you know, the, the impact that their work is going to have um, on, you know, to meet those goals of compassion and improving the compassion of society. Uh, one, one thing that's a, that's a growing change, I would say, even more than millennials were, is they value influence over authority. Um, they care, they, they prefer to be led rather than commanded. Um, I think we can all relate to that, um, but I think that they, they value this much more. On social media, they take they listen to and trust influencers substantially more than I do for certain. I mean, uh, they, they take that area very seriously. And in the workplace, your influence over them may be more important than your authority over them for in, in terms of get, getting productivity. Um, they have both intrinsic and extrinsic motivations, meaning they, they, they have self-motivation um, but they also very much appreciate external motivations. So we'll be talking more about that in a minute. And they are a strong embracers of the idea of, of this. Groups have, their, they want to be a part of a group and have goals, but they want to have their individual contribution. That's very important to them. Um, so the next area I'd like to talk to, I'm going to talk more about that last bit. I mean, just say that about that individual contribution later. It's, it's really important. Keep that in mind. 
So are they innovators? Well, the, the short answer is yes, but how, you know, how? How are they? So one of the methods that's out there that's, that's commonly used is this Berkeley Method of Entrepreneurship Questionnaire, which helps you get an idea about how um, entrepreneurial or how innovative a person is going to tend to be based on their answers. And it's divided up into these sort of separate, um, these uh, seven, six, I'm sorry, I can't count today, uh, sections, right? So trust is the first one. Um, what is their ability to trust someone without um, expecting anything in return? Um, and I, oh, and I've given them grades. So those are my personal opinions. Uh, and uh, so not, not based on science exactly, but based on all of the other data, kind of looking at it as a whole and understanding them. To them, there is a certain amount of trust that is earned. Um, they, they take trust to be very important. We'll talk about that when we talk about leadership, um, but trust is hard earned and is very fragile. Uh, and so remember that piece. Plan to fail is the next one. Resilience is, are they comfortable with failure? And the answer is a resounding yes. They consider failure to be a part of getting towards success. This is a message they finally received from, from us trying to tell them failure is important and is a part of learning. They embrace that. That is very good for innovation. Uh, diversity. They are the most diverse group in the world. And while they're Acceptance of different diverse opinions is still evolving. They are more accepting than anyone in, in previous generations, including millennials. Um, they, so their level of acceptance extends far beyond what, what um, the categories that a millennial would consider as diverse. So we're not talking about just race anymore. We're talking about ideas, culture, uh, you know, gender, sexual orientation. Um, all of these things are, are elements of diversity that this generation embraces, um, at least so far, that's what we think. Um, mental strength, do you believe you can change the world? And, and yes, they do, they do. Uh, I'm concerned that that might be fading because of recent events um, and lack of progress in other areas that they care about. But this is a group that does think they can change the world. You can think of your um, Greta Thornburgs as good example, uh, you know, others like her. Uh, they want to have an impact. Uh, perfectionism. So is good enough? Perfect. We don't know. We don't know about this with them. Uh, jury's certainly out. And there's no, there's no uh, data either way. Um, so an interesting thing to speculate about, but I won't. Uh, collaboration. Are they collaborative? And I gave them a C on this one because I think that they, they are collaborative, but they have a strong individual individual. Um, focus that can can potentially get in the way of good collaboration. Uh, next, they are they are driven by curiosity and open mindedness. I consider that to be a very strong innovation focus. Um, they are good at gathering information very rapidly. Uh, hence, the YouTube education I talked about earlier. They can find information fast on the internet. They're just not very good at critically and now analyzing that information. Um, that is a challenge. Um, to put it another way, the taught method is the best method in their eyes. Um, they're in the box thinkers. Uh, I won't say, of course, remember, this is not all of them and they're not 100% these, these traits, but they're in the box thinkers. I don't think that's terribly negative. Uh, in the box is a good way to think before you think out of the box. It's in the box for a reason. Um, and so that's not bad. And it's also good if you need to teach them, you know, what you think is the best way to do something because they will listen and remember that. The challenge is that they might not doubt that, that it's, they may not have a doubt about it. You should doubt that. I don't know. As a Gen Xer, we were doubtful of everything, question everything. If you told us it was the best way, we would not believe you. Uh, this is a generation that will believe you if you tell them that. So... What are some of the, the workplace related human factors, right? So that we talk, I talked about trust, that's in capital letters for a reason, it's extremely important. Do not break their trust um, as a leader or they will not give it back. Um, this can be helped by personal relationships and ethical leadership. 
I mean, I'll talk more about those later, but um, demonstrate ethics to them. It will be important. Uh, give them frequent feedback. This is annoying to a lot of us older folks, but they love feedback. It's important. It can be negative. It can be, I mean, as long as it's constructive, but give it regularly and frequently. Um, they are iterative people. They want to know when they're doing something wrong so they can change. Um, I mentioned diversity already. They would like that in the workplace. They expect to see it and they expect to experience diverse ideas. Um, and they do, as a, as a member of a team, when you have them on team, want an individual role uh, that is for them. Um, now, you might say, of course, in a team, everyone has an individual role, right? Of course you do. You've got your homework assignments. But to them, that's the important part. It's when they separate from the team meetings and do the work themselves and bring that back to the meeting. In fact, highly recommended if you're, if you're going to do team meetings, um, give them a challenge or give them an assignment before the meeting. And give them some time to do it so they have something completed already to bring to that first meeting. Um, that's important. It's good advice in a general sense. I so what about work conditions? I'm, I'm starting off with one. This may seem like a benefit to most people, but I, I think of flexible hours as a condition of work as well. So um, it's very important uh, to a lot of these people. So if you have the opportunity, of course, it's re within reason, um, try to make their hours flexible. COVID has made this worse. Uh, because now flexibility is including location of work. So consider if you can give them a mixed in-person remote opportunity, um, but try to be open to the flexibility of hours. So I'm sorry, I'm going to stick on this for another minute. Because uh, that flexibility is kind of ingrained in their whole entire system of thinking. Uh, so these are people who also are very into the gig economy. They took that cue from millennials and they're running with it. I have a niece, she's 14. She's on her second entrepreneurial business endeavor already. Um, so expect them to be doing other things outside of work as well. I think if you try to prevent them from doing additional freelance work on the side, you're going to fail or they're going to leave. Um, but do what you can with this. Um, the other, you know, highest on this list that I'm showing you on the right here is, you know, other things that you would just expect. They do have a high desire for, for health insurance, more higher even than millennials, which was higher than X. It's getting higher and higher. Be ready for that. I mentioned, I mentioned mixed virtual and in-person already. If it's an option, accessibility is related to that. Safety and comfort seem like no brainers, right? So I don't know if I need to go much further into this. Uh, so I'm not going to. What sort of benefits are we looking for, right? Other than flexible hours. Uh, uh, flexible hours. Um, I say that they are interested in fair pay over high pay, but still they're interested in high pay. A, a high salary is, is very important to these these people more so than it was for millennials. So that loss of caring too much about the money that you may have seen with millennials is gone. Um, they do care about a high salary, but they care more about that being fair pay. So it's more important that it is fair to them that they're getting what they are worth. And they're looking around at the other people in the company to make sure those people are getting what they're worth too. So that's a piece of that compassion, a piece of that community that they value is they're going to look around. They're going to ask each other what their salaries are. Okay, um, that's going to happen. Um, here's just another sort of representation of the same kind of data. It, this is it's a little surprising to me after millennials, but you know, would you take lower pay for a more flexible schedule? Most of Gen Z is saying no, I won't. Um, so there's clearly a priority here. Um, millennials would have. Uh, Gen Z probably will not. Um, when you're talking about benefits, make sure they're real. Make sure they're real. If you give someone vacation, don't deny them their vacation, even with snide remarks or anything like that. Don't, uh, it, they expect you know, to be offered benefits that are legit benefits and not just something on paper. 
So that seems like obvious ethics to me, but it's not. It's not obvious, it seems, in the working world. Um, they would like an array of opportunities. Lateral moves are common uh, for millennials. It's going to be the same um, for Generation Z. They're going to make lateral moves regularly. Um, advancement is obviously interesting to everyone. Um, clearly defined work and, and work assignments and their policies, policies for your company, define them clearly. Um, it's important that they know what they're expected to do. So that, and if, if they know what they're expected to do, they will do it. If that's wishy-washy, it's difficult for them um, to be productive. Uh, they also feel anxiety, um, you know, when they're not sure what they're supposed to be doing or if they're not sure it's being done right. This has a lot to do with that, you know, and that willingness and wish to get the best method from a teacher. Um, when it comes to the work itself, life does not e equal work for this group. So don't expect that. But weirdly enough, success equals happiness in their eyes. Okay, that's not terribly healthy, uh, but to them, success, which is a broad term, okay, not just in, in work, but it does equal happiness in their eyes. Uh, they will, they, that can work for you or work against you. Their motto, so millennials, the, the motto was, and it's been maybe older than that even, is you know, work smart, not hard. This is a group that says work hard, not long. Okay, so they do have a good work ethic. Uh, they think they are the hardest workers. Every previous generation has thought that, by the way. Um, I didn't look into it, but every generation thinks they're the hardest workers, this one included. Um, but they are very fine with working hard. Uh, the hours are less important in their philosophy. Uh, so I think that that comes with there being flexible hours, but flexible number of hours put in a strict 40 hour a week uh, gig to them, they'll do it. And they'll understand it, but it's not as meaningful as it was to previous generations. They do value meaning and impact of their work. So make sure that the meaning and the, the effect of what they're doing is, is represented, especially when you're talking about them in a team. You're talking about their individual role. Make sure when you assign that role that you give them and that you tell them why it's necessary and important to be done. I think that's good for everyone. But I think their previous generations, or particularly boomers, might not have valued that as highly. Um, one negative side in this is that they will avoid work they don't like. This is not something I expected. Uh, and it plays out to a level that is, you will notice. You will notice this. Um, I've had success with, I've, I, I've only been experimenting with solutions to this problem, so good luck. Um, but they will try to avoid work that they don't like. How do teams work with them? I, I mentioned this already, but to talk about it again, they care about the I in, in team. Um, I know there's a joke associated with this, with this image, but I'm gonna skip the joke. The, the, this is important to remember. Um, make sure that they understand their role in the team. So they're fine with working with the team. Make sure their role is clear and meaningful. Uh, next, I want to talk a little bit about generational conflict. Um, you will experience some of this. You'll experience it with technology and engagement with your own company. If you run a company and you have a mix of ages, you're going to recognize that anyway, right? You'll have seen it already. Um, but one thing you will probably enjoy, and hopefully you'll get a group of Gen Zers, Zers that have this characteristic, is they, they like to be taught by someone. So mentorship. Apprenticeship is probably more appropriate for this generation than, than the previous ones. Um, they do listen. It's again, it's coming back to that taught method is best method, right? They'll listen to you as a mentor. I highly recommend placing these people, these young people with an older person that's mentor them, but then consider also reverse mentorship in other areas. So for example, technology. Your younger users are going to be able to use that product project management software better, probably right off the bat, or they'll learn it faster. Try to give the opportunity for your older workers from previous generations to learn something from the younger ones. Um, but, you know, it's good news that they're going to listen. Um, 
uh, to, you know, so consider some apprenticeships in your business. So what effect did COVID had? So a lot of this research I did before or, or during rather COVID and there, the book, the jury's still out on a lot of this information, but here's some of the latest information. Um, this is from, by the way, a site that I do recommend because they offer a lot of information for free, the Center of Generational Kinetics. Um, they release yearly reports that are interesting surveys. They have good infographics, you know, that are easily easy to, to, to absorb. Um, they don't always agree with everyone else, but that's all right. Everyone seems to disagree on this at the moment anyway. But 45% of Gen Z feel like their generation will not be as successful as the previous generations. So that's a large portion. Um, so I, it's not a surprise. Uh, millennials kind of had it pretty good at the beginning, at least. This is a generation that's concerned. They have a lot of concerns. <clears throat> 53% of Gen Z think their views for the future have permanently changed since the pandemic. Okay, so things are changing fast. So um, some of that previous information I've given you, I, I think it will maintain, um, uh, but be ready for some of it to change. 40% uh, of them even are rethinking their entire career because of COVID. Um, so how do we lead them? I'm gonna talk through just a few of these. I realize we're cutting it close on time, so I'll be uh, brief about this, but be an active leader. Laissez-faire, la laissez if I can, so if I'm saying that right, uh, leadership is not a good idea with this group. Be active, be in there. Um, authentic, authenticity and ethical, authentic leadership and ethical leadership are not exactly the same thing, but you're going to need to con converge these two. Be your authentic self at work, um, foibles and, and flaws and all. Uh, they will respect that greatly. Uh, authenticity is important to them. They do not like fakes. Um, eth ethical, we already talked about. Ethics is important to them. Uh, you demonstrate it to them, please. Uh, if you show ethical leadership, you will get um, better productivity out of them. Transformational is the last kind of leader that you need to be. There, there's a lot of literature and, and theory behind transformational leadership. I'd encourage you to read some of it. Um, but I'm running out of time, so I'm going to gloss over it a little bit. So here are some straightforward recommendations. This is basically it. This is the end of the presentation, then we'll get to some questions. Base your approach to leadership on authentic, ethical, and transformative leadership. Synthesize these methods and you will succeed. That is a very high bar, hence the, hence the, the uh, pole vaulter in the previous line. High bar, I understand that, shoot for it. Embrace technological solutions for your organization obviously. Uh, be specific about policies and assignments. Emphasize individual roles and teams. Provide frequent feedback in addition to their standard review. It could be a good job you're doing good shake handshake in person. Do it in person too, if you can, you know, within reason. Embrace and actively pursue diversity of all sorts. Um, provide mentorship and reverse mentorship and standardize a flexible schedule if it's reasonable. Um, for your organization. If you do these set of things, you're going to have luck. You're going to have success with this organization. And when all else fails or you're not having success, ask them and they will answer you. Authenticity is important to them. Ask them and you will get an answer and follow that lead. So thank you for your time. I understand that that was a lot, um, but I'd love to hear questions. Well, Jake, thank you. That was a uh... As I told our audience at the outset, this is an information rich presentation. Uh, I've got about three pages of notes in addition to some questions you and I talked about earlier. You know, it really seems as I, I, I've looked at your presentation, you know, during the time you were preparing it, um, I actually read the paper from about which, from which this is based and which will, uh, a version of which I believe that Jefferson will ultimately be publishing or at least posting as a PDF form. Uh, for uh, public uh, printing by others who might want it. Uh, I'm trying to think of where to begin. Is this really a fascinating conversation, uh, fascinating thing? And I think of it as, um, it, what's interesting is for me, this is really kind of theoretical. I, I'm, uh, I'm no longer a leader. I, although I, for roughly 40 years, 
uh, led everything uh, as you're doing now from leading a department to divisions to a whole school to, to entire organizations. And I'm thinking about how you, how you approach this. Some of, some of your advice is just really good rock solid advice for any leader uh, leading any group in any context, uh, unless you happen to be in a foxhole in the midst of a firefight, in which case it helps if, one, if somebody knows what the hell they're doing and you listen to them. But fortunately, uh, by the grace of God or, or whatever, most of us are not in a foxhole in a firefight. Uh, so what you're talking about is some wonderful ideas on leadership. One of the things we talked about is you said there seems to be a paradox regarding collaboration and independence. And one of the things I heard throughout is this paradox between wanting to be led, we'll use that verb for the moment, and wanting to be, well, you never phrased it this way, but individuals, uh, um, wanting to be autonomous to a certain extent. Um, is, that a, is that a fair thing that there's, there seems to be a, a, a contradiction? Yeah. And, they, and is, is that a two-part question? Is that a fair takeaway that there is this contradiction between wanting to be led and yet at the same time valuing and wanting autonomy? And then I'll ask part two of that question after you've given us your insights. Uh, yeah, yes, there is. Uh, there's a there's an apparent contradiction there it's a it's paradoxical in that um it's hard to kind of meet the middle of that and they're not really in the middle it's like they value both right so they're not like a being centrist about that topic it's like i want to be led but i also want to do my own thing at the same time i think there's an element of that that may have to do with um being young you know you know the world right now but i i don't really have a cause i don't have a root cause for it i don't yeah, well that you touched on one of the things i was going to ask is is this unique to this generation or is it just a function of being young so i uh, is it unique to them i i don't think so i think it is a a higher trait it's certainly different from millennials we're at the same age um so when if you're looking back millennials are like the so I know less about them, but they are the most studied generation in history. There's every thousands and thousands of papers. If you're curious about millennials, you'll find more information than you can eat. Um, and I would say that there's less known about Z, but there is a difference there. There's certainly a difference um, in their independence. It's almost like, so there may be an explanation in that most of Gen Z is ra raised by Gen Xers who are fiercely independent libertarian kind of cynics. So that has an effect on them. And I think that that balance- Gen Xers of, are very much, li uh, they're, 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 they may not like you hear it, but they're, their parents were the boomers and they are their parents' children, perhaps in some ways on steroids. And so for those boomers of which I'm one, be careful about what you wish for, you might get it. Uh, they, they raised their children to be and we're overgeneralizing like crazy here. We have to be sure. very careful when we talk about a whole generation, but of course. I, I get what you mean. I mean, as long as we understand we're talking in broad strokes to which there are a lot of exceptions. Indeed. Um, yeah. One of the things that struck me about this is Gen Z having spent my entire professional life uh, with, a, with one or two minor exceptions in education to higher education. Gen Z, just for the audience and my benefit, they are the generation born in what year or, or after this? What? Uh, roughly the mid nineties. So they were, let's say they are born in 1995. Oh, oh, wait, I'm so late nineties, I should have said. Yeah. Okay, let's say 19, to pick a date, it's on one of your charts, but 97 or 98, that means they go to school in 03, 04, that's after 9-11. What struck me though is they are the generation who went to school during the No Child Left Behind era. Ah. And the No Child Left Behind era mm. is the era of high stakes testing. And we could turn this into, and I know we have teachers who, who are Jeffersonians who watch our programming. Mm -hmm. They'll understand what I'm talking about because a lot of us talked about this. 
Well, you made the comment along the way, they're very, very good. Gen Z students, young people are very, very good at gathering information. Mm -hmm. They're not particularly good at critical thinking, mm -hmm. which is analyzing information, sorting it out. Well, that's one of the things for, this is 2022. That's one of the things for the last 15 years or more, people who are invested in education have pointed out that what you get is a group of people who will feed you back what you gave them. Not, I, I don't want to overstate it, not uncritically, but so when you take away and the, the facts of the matter are that teachers get held accountable in, in many cases directly, but in all cases indirectly on how their students do on state proficiency exams. Mm -hmm. uh, teachers unions have pretty much protected, and I'm not complaining about that, they've pretty much protected individual state teachers, but schools within districts and districts within states get measured on those proficiency exams. So one of the things that happens is even if you would prefer to teach a class through a discussion group method, you know these students are going to be tested um, in a, on a multiple choice test. So as a teacher, you're put in an ethical double bind. You got to teach the, uh, that in the way that helps. Anyways, I, could, we, I, I don't <laughs> want to waste all our time on this, but that, re that really, I have to say, and I would love to hear feedback from anyone else who's watching who is either a current teacher or has spent a lot of time. I, I think one of the things, the, the way you describe Gen Z, particularly, I'm setting aside technology and I'm setting aside uh, the socio-political, socio-cultural political soup that they have to swim in. I'm just talking about the way you describe how they approach information and, and in many ways the world. That's what no child left behind. That's what high stakes test, you got it. We got as a society exactly what high stakes testing. Mm -hmm. You know, people who are good at gathering information but not real good at sorting it out which, by the way, does have political implications. Indeed. You know, the there's a... Uh, there's, uh, I, I thought that was fascinating. I, I don't want to waste the, your time or the audience's time on that. I, I'm going to prompt, my, prompt myself based on your, on, on your, your, with, a, with a comment that I think is, is useful. Um, it's possible that it's related to that testing, which is why I'm bringing it up. But I, I mentioned and I stressed a lot that they, you need to pay attention to your ethics as a leader of Gen Z. But I'm also a little concerned about Gen Z's ethics in a general sense. Um, COVID may have, may have made everything horribly worse, but cheating during COVID was through the roof. And a lot of the students, uh, okay, I've only got anecdotal evidence on this one, but I know that the cheating was through the roof. That's, there's evidence for that. They seem to interpret this as just what was necessary to get it done on time or what was necessary to pass the the, the, the class, what was the worst of two evils? Either I fail this class or I cheat. And they're choosing that, the, the unethical decision. So I'm concerned about that. I'm not sure if that's going to pan out or if I'm just paranoid, but I think there's some evidence that we may have some ethics problems with this generation, We're probably going to have to make some. Well, that, that's a really interesting observation and I'll be candid. I'm not quite sure where to go. I have a lot of things. You know, I'm not quite sure where to go with that, other than uh, maybe an, uh, um, uh, 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 this will be an overwhelming generation. Humans are utilitarian. Yeah. And one of the things a values-based education, critical thinking does, is, ta is teach, is actually temper, uh, mitigate, tone down, tame, I'm, I'm searching for the right verb, tame that innate, in, um, uh, I, I know if there's a psychologist, what, an educational psychologist, I, I want to be careful about the language, but I'm going to call it an innate, not an instinctive behavior, but it might be instinctive. Humans are, you know, they're going to survive. You know, if you think of Maslow's hierarchy, you know, you start from the bottom up, you start with security and survival. That's, <laughs> that's the first thing. I mean, the very first level of motivation is survive. I got to survive. Uh, the second thing is I need security. I need some guarantee or some sense of confidence that I'll continue to be able to survive. It's only when I've taken care of those two things that I get higher order motivations. Uh, I think Maslow's hierarchy of needs or hierarchy of motivations, and I know he's, there's some people who will argue this, 
But I think, you know, at least as an entry point to the discussion, it's a, it's a powerful analytical tool and you just put your finger on it. Hmm. In, the, in the world they're in, uh, education. So I, I think that's fascinating observation. Um, I, you know, tied into that, tied into cheating, tied into what I was, uh, the thing on big test, uh, high stakes testing, uh, everything comes down to a test. I mean, in fact, getting into college comes down to a test. Uh, it shouldn't. I mean, we, we don't have time to get into SAT uh, <laughs> discussions and how it's one of the more, well, whatever. I won't get into that. I mean, it's directly correlated to household income and parents' education. I mean, it's just a start. It's not even a curved line. I mean, I understand if there's a mathematician listing all lines or curves, this isn't even a curve. It's just boom, it's straight up. As household income and parents' education rises, those numbers go up and, and that's it. Um, for, all, for all the obvious reasons. I, I'm, I'm, str I'm, I'm struck also, uh, the, the group goals versus individuality. I like the thing I like, but it makes me a little nervous that they want to be taught. That's another byproduct of high stakes testing. Hmm. Um, I mean, as a teacher or as a former teacher, uh, every teacher in the audience knows that the secret isn't so, the secret sauce is an engaged student. It doesn't matter how great a teacher you are. However, we want to define great teaching skills. If the students aren't interested and disengaged, uh, but if the students engaged and interested, now now you have it, something. And so that's that's fascinating that they they want to learn. I'm also interested in influencers. How do they decide who are influencers? <laughs> who gets to be an influencer? Well, it's people with that, that they're interested in, but people with, you know, bazillion followers on social media have tremendous influence. That's what's tricky because yeah. it doesn't follow that the person with a bazillion followers on social media actually knows what they're talking about. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, certainly. You know, that's influencers, an that's an interesting word. Influencers comes from group theory mm -hmm. and in communications uh, theory and, and, and the science of persuasion, uh, Every group has one person who is the key influential. So to simplify this, think of any group you belong to or, or, or the group you have, a, you know, a work group. One person in that group will be recognized as the person who is expert on it. Uh, and people will look to that person. What becomes important is though that in a, um, in a subtle group, in a sophisticated group, uh, sophisticated is the wrong word, but in a, in a more collaborative group, the, influent, the influencer moves. So there might be one person who by maybe by virtue of position, the chair they're sitting in, they're the boss, for example, they have a lot of de facto influence, but subject matter influence goes to different people. So if we're in a group of people and somebody uh, walks in and says, my car won't start, well, Sally knows a lot about cars. She becomes the person. But if somebody walks in and says, I think I'm having a heart attack, it's Bill, who's a nurse, who everybody looks at. What do we do? Uh, how does that work? In, or is in, that, in, in this generation's world, is it, real in, is it real expertise or is it perceived expertise by how many likes, which that turns into how you look, how glib you are, how, you know, you know, all of these ways in which you can be a good community. I always told students before when I used to teach composition in another life, I'm sorry, but this is a fascinating topic to me, is mm -hmm. that one of the reasons you want to learn to know how to read and write really well and how to speak on your feet really well is people will defer to you if you're articulate. If it turn, even, even if it turns out a month and a half later, they discover you didn't know what the hell you were talking about. <laughs> you got that month and a half because it sounded like you knew what you were talking about. Indeed. And that's and when I think about social media, I think that's that whole phenomena on, well, another, you know, back to the cliche, that's that whole phenomena on steroids. Mm -hmm. Yes. I okay, mean, I'm it, sorry for going on for so long. No, no, it, because it's an important part of their life is, you know, influence and you know, it could be YouTubers, but it could also be a coworker. Um, 
But uh, you know, in the workplace, I think it's just important to remember that your authority over over them is not enough. So just being the the king in in the castle won't cut it. Yeah, being persuasive you know, persuasion is important. Yeah, I mean that's there, in general good old, ideas, right? That's a good. I made a note on that one, by the way, on leadership. That's an actually great observation, Jake. Uh, the Gen Z will have to go to their history books to get this, and it won't even. It, well, he, he was a president while I was alive, but in their book, in their social science book, that has 25 chapters, he's probably back in chapter 19. <laughs> it happened a while ago, but President Eisenhower, when he was a general, had a piece of string on his desk. And people always asked him, what's the string about? He said, the string's my philosophy of leadership. And they would say, what do you mean? He said, well, push the string. He would push the string. What happens? It clumps up and jams. But he said, if you get in front of it, and lead, pull it and lead. They, you know, people want to be led by someone they trust. They don't want to be coerced. That that's an important observation. We did get one uh, one comment from a viewer who uh, tends to agree with the thing about high stakes testing. I'm looking at the time. We're over an hour, uh, Raven. I'm not sure what the house rules are here. But if we want to, in fairness to our audience, and I apologize for talking so much here at the end, but I was just fascinated by Jake's uh, research. It just resonated. So I really want to thank Jake for an excellent presentation. Uh, tell our audience that it'll be posted to the Jefferson Facebook page and website, and I think YouTube, so they can see it at later times. Uh, and sometime within the next uh, month or two, it will also be published as a paper. I believe, at least in PDF format that they can download. But once again, thank you, Jake. That was extremely interesting. Thank you for the opportunity and for all of your attention and time. I appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Jake and Andy. Um, and like Andy said, this will be posted on our website and YouTube for people to view afterwards on demand. Um, and if you have more questions, feel free to email me. My email is Clark, C-L-A-R-K at J-E-S Erie dot org. Thank you for watching. Um, for more information about the JES, including how to register for additional events, please visit jeserie.org and be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and YouTube and Instagram. For the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Raven Clark. Thank you for listening and learning with us.